Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Everybody's coming in. I'm Kara Egan, the Director of Marketing and PR here at the Seattle Art Museum, and I just wanted to welcome you here tonight. We are so happy to be co-hosting this with the University of Washington's Communication Leadership Program for this very special event tonight called Sleepless in Triadle, which is a great name. And it's very fitting that the special guest is here at SAM tonight um, because he actually works at one of the greatest museums in the entire world, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art also has a special place in our heart because as many of you probably know her, Sandra Jackson Dumont, our former Deputy Director of Education and Public Programs is now there. She left us this summer and is heading up their education programs there. And I'm sure becoming fast BFFs with Sri. And so um, he was just talking about how they text three times a day. <laughs> so, and I, we miss her, I miss her text, so. Um, but, and also speaking of BFFs of Sandra's, Hanson Hossein is also one of her BFFs, and I'm delighted to introduce him tonight. I think his real title should be Seattle's Chief Storytelling Officer, and, but his official bio that I was told to abbreviate <laughs> by, him, by him says that he's the director of the Communication Leadership Graduate Program at the University of Washington. He also heads HRH Media Group, a media production and communication strategy firm. And he's a pioneer of digital content creation, which many of you know that already. He's directed award-winning documentary films, Rising from the Ruins and Independent America, The Two-Lane Search for Mom and Pop, which have been broadcast worldwide. He's also an award-winning journalist, and he has years of field experience in the Middle East, in Africa, and Eastern Europe. And there's many, many other achievements, and that's just the abbreviated, as I said. So Hanson, come on up. Thanks very much. Um, you can also just call me Mini Shri. Uh, we obviously look very similar. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome Shri back to Seattle. It was my idea to call this Sleepless in Seattle, just to really brand it. Um, he's, he's just a founder of knowledge. I've known him for 20 years, and even before there was social media, there was social Shri. This man knows how to build a network, he knows how to communicate, he knows how to use digital. Um, after we did this session two years ago at the University of Washington, a few months later, he phoned me in the middle of the night saying, hey, I got this amazing opportunity to move to the Met, and I was absolutely thrilled for him. And I obviously have a great relationship with the Seattle Art Museum, so it just felt like a natural thing to bring the two forces together to have this great event. And as you heard, I'm the director of the Communication Leadership Program, and what Shri practices and does better than anybody else on the planet is things that we try to learn in our own program and share with our own community. So we thought this was a great opportunity to basically encapsulate in this workshop what we do in our classrooms. And so I'm pleased to see so many of our students and alumni here. And we just see this as a service and a connection to our community. So I'm just grateful to Shri for once again offering to bring his expertise to the table. So with that, we're going to have a great session with him. I'll leave the Q&A later. But Shri, Shri Navasan, Columbia University. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to be back in Seattle. And thank you so much, Hanson, and thank you to the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, when I've done this event in the past, we've charged more than $100, and we were able to do this for almost nothing. When I posted that the price was $6.17 with the uh, extra uh, handling charges, someone asked if it was a typo. They thought it was $617. So let's thank Comlead and iHeartSam for letting us all be here together tonight. So what we're going to do is spend the next hour and a half or so talking and sharing ideas and just getting to uh, think as much as we can about social, digital, mobile in kind of new ways and reinforcing some ideas we may already know. Uh, throughout the presentation today, I hope you will uh, be uh, doing as much um, kind of tweeting, sharing, and amplifying what's going on here. And we're going to try and do something very unusual for me. This is the first time ever that we're going to, I'm going to do my entire session 
uh, off my phone here, if, or actually this is Hanson's phone. So one second. So one second. <laughs> okay, one second. Let's see if I can figure all this out. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, I am too. So just one second. So I have to figure out how to get rid of the bookmarks. Beautiful. See, everybody knows more than I do about this. Okay. So um, how many of you came to the session we did uh, a couple of years ago? Any, anybody? A few of you. Look at that. Thank you so much. This is called the triumph of hope over experience. They came once, didn't work, so they came back again. So thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And you can see that the others who did come the last time decided not to show up. So I'm going to try and share as much as I can about what has changed between last time and this time. But it would be really wrong of me to start our conversation today without first acknowledging the horrible, horrifying events of today in Paris. And even today in the Seattle area, there was a lockdown in schools because they thought there might be a gunman. And that didn't pan out, fortunately. But I'd just like to take a moment and just reflect on Paris. And uh, to me, Paris is the fountain of all that we do at the Met. Uh, everything from the, uh, the, muse the idea of the museums and the idea of the, of the art museum, the, the work that we do, the way we think about uh, paintings and sculptures and all the great French artists. So today, we're really thinking about them. And I, and I think it's appropriate that we're here at the Seattle Art Museum uh, on a day like today. And at the Met, we've been posting throughout the day art from Paris as our way of showing solidarity with the people of Paris. So I'm just going to take a minute, and we'll just moment of silence. <clears throat> Thank you. As you can see from this, uh, from from the presentation here, that we're working off of Google Slides, off the iPhone system, and I know that's awkward to talk about Google in the land of Microsoft and Amazon. So uh, as we talk, if there are products or services that are local and better, or uh, local and smarter, local and cheaper, local and whatever, just feel, feel free to speak up. This is a session where it's not just me talking at you. I want you to help me by posting, sharing, and uh, creating content with me. So one of the things I would love for you to do is to post with the hashtag Seattle throughout tonight. Last time we did this, we trended three times in the day uh, during the evening. Today it's going to be much harder because uh, I, I, I haven't been building up this morning. Uh, what I would have done all day was help plant the seeds of having Seattle trend, and I didn't do that because I said this morning on Twitter that I have nothing to contribute during the day with all the stuff going on, so I'm going to be silent on Twitter the entire day I was silent until I posted two, two cartoons from my really good friends who are award winning. One is a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. So I hope you'll take a look at Sri to see it. Uh, but if we do trend, uh, there's a prize for someone who catches the, uh, the, uh, the trended um, tweet. Uh, if you take a screenshot and send it to me first with hash three Seattle, I'll give you a prize. And we're going to get to see Hansen's private text messages, and all kinds of things here. So that's going to be very interesting. And you're seeing the live tweets come in. So if you want to have whatever we're saying show up here, just, uh, just uh, tweet there. And it says, hi, mom. <laughs> and then you take a picture. That's what you do. You, take the, you tweet that and then take the picture. And then you can, you can see that. Uh, by the way, he's at HRH Media. And so I hope you'll follow him there. And it's, hash, uh, and it's at comlead for the, the, the UW uh, communications program. So whenever I teach, and I, I said this the last time we were all together in Seattle, I use the words, uh, the, the letters ABC. ABC for always be collecting, which means always be using your phone to collect things. So I hope I will see all of you pulling out your phone and taking pictures throughout the evening. 
And then you might be A, B, C, always be collecting, but it's S, A, A, share as appropriate. Does that make sense? So we're always collecting, but we're not sharing all the time. And I have a dashboard that I'll be using to see who tweets the most, who posts the most, so that'll be fun to track as well. And we might give a prize to the person who does the most tweets, the most influential tweets, things like that. ABC also, in my mind, st stands for always be charging your phone, right? <laughs> and here's what I do with my phone. I have a Mophie on it. How many people own a Mophie or some kind of battery pack? Everybody should. Uh, it, it is really important. They will not believe decades from now that there was a time in America when people would get on their hands and knees at airports <laughs> looking for power. And our kids will not believe this. But that did happen, and it is happening today. The iPhone 6 has better battery life, and the Samsung phones have better battery life, and the Microsoft Nokia phones have better battery life. But the iPhone 5 has terrible battery life. Uh, somebody wants to say, add something? Oh, good question. Thank you. M-O-P-H-I-E. Please ask questions like that, because I'll, I, I, I might not uh, remember to spell that out. Thank you. Uh, I also went out and bought this on Amazon. Uh, this is called Jockery, J-O-C-K-E-R-Y, and it's a battery brick. And um, I encourage you to not, you don't have to get this one I got because it's a really good, nice color, but get any one of these things. I, I use this and this, and it's still not enough for uh, the kinds of things I'm trying to do. And so I walk around with all these gadgets and wires sticking out of me. But uh, you should always have a, a good battery pack if you can. And I uh, want to remind you, my Twitter handle is at Sri. My Instagram is SriNet. On Facebook, I'm SriNet and Sri Tips. And you also have my email address. And if you just take a picture of this, then you have a copy of all of this. And all the slides are at Sriadle Slides. So you can just go in, and uh, I hope you will tweet that to your friends. And you say, I'm at a really boring session. Here are the slides. I don't care what you say. As long as you put hash three addle at the end, we'll be able to look at it. But everybody understands that the slides are there. And I can actually blow that up. And you can see that, right? So that's nice. OK. Any questions so far? All right. So uh, um, I'm going to share, you know, what I'm going to do is share what I've learned at the museum. I've, I've been at the museum for a little over a year. Four months, 14 days, and 36 hours. Uh, but who's counting? I, I came to uh, the Met after being at Columbia University in the journalism school for uh, 21 years. I arrived on campus at 21, and I planned to leave at 91. I loved every minute of what I was doing there. I had some incredible students, people like Hanson Hossein, who uh, came there and taught me more than I ever had a chance to teach him. <laughs> And we got to, and I, I loved what I was doing, but I had grown up four blocks from the Met, and I went to school one block from the Met at a school called PS6. And when uh, I, I developed, uh, the, the teacher there told us that it's criminal to live in a city like New York and not go to the Met once a month. And I believe it's the same thing in Seattle. If you don't go to a museum, you don't go to uh, uh, the Seattle Art Museum once a month, then that's kind of not fair to uh, yourself and to the museum world. But she said it's really criminal to be just one block away as we were and not go to the Met every week. And so she would drag us to the Met, not just for art, but science, history, politics. And I developed what I call a 30-year one-way love affair with the Met. And if you love someone for 30 years and she calls you, you've got to take the call. And then with your wife's permission, carry on, which is what we did. And the last time I was in Seattle, I brought my wife and kids, and we had a really good time. And my children are 11 now. And uh, I want to make sure that we have a chance for you guys to say hello to my wife. She's Rupa Online, R-O-O-P-A Online. I hope you'll tweet her and say thanks for letting him come to Seattle. And, um, but I want to tell you about this danger of what I did by leaving Columbia. I gave up full free tuition for my children at Columbia. Oh, the right reaction, right? You can hear the gasps. Uh, now, they may not be smart enough to get into Columbia, so I only, so basically, I also gave up half tuition anywhere in the world. 
right reaction, correct? It gets worse. How could it get worse? It gets worse because it's all pre-tax dollars. Oh, that's Henson's. Yeah, I knew. I always knew he was a fool. Is what Henson's thinking. But I left that on the table. Why? Because I wanted to go to the Met. I wanted to work in the museum world. And they wanted to hire somebody who was not from the museum world, somebody who had no art background. I was imminently overqualified in that sense. And that's why I'm here. And so I'm going to share with you some of my ideas, what I've learned, and I want you all to jump in. And even though this is about the art world, it's going to be stuff that applies in every part of, um, of American life and whatever business you're in. Okay. So, oops, let me just go in here. And I always start by talking about our building at the Met because whatever we do, it's about connecting the physical and the digital, the in-person and the online. And I like to tell people that I got my job in part because of a TEDx talk. It was about this idea of connecting the physical and digital. You can find it online. And my folk, my colleagues saw that, or future colleagues saw that and said, this is what we want to do at the Met. And so how do we connect the physical and the digital, the in-person and the online? And what I want to also share with you is that we, we created this new plaza at the Met. And it had been closed for several, uh, several years. But we were able to open it. And when we did, we took photographs from across the way on Fifth Avenue with our, uh, with our professional photographers. We have uh, a, a dozen professional photographers at the Met. And we took these pictures. And this particular one that we really loved was taken on an iPhone. And what that tells you something that when I was um, dean of student affairs at the journalism school at Columbia, people would ask me, how can you sleep at night charging people Ivy League tuition money for an industry that's collapsing? And I would say, first of all, it's morphing. It's not collapsing. But in a world where everybody's a publisher, the trained professional Publishers and editors and writers stand taller. In a world where everybody's a photographer, the trained professional photographers stand taller. And that's what the students at the Con Lead program are learning from Hansen and all his colleagues. And it's fantastic that that's what they're doing. And that's what we need to be thinking about in all our lives. That the if I had taken this with my iPhone, this would not have come out so well. But it's because a trained professional took it, it came out so beautifully. And that's what I'd like you to keep in mind. So that's the day view. And that's the night view. And I'm constantly thinking, what has changed since I was here two years ago? I spoke in 2013, and what has changed? And I'm, I'm struck by the fact that I'm presenting off a phone. Tells you how much the world has changed. You can now edit Google Docs on your phone. And that's maybe all you need. I don't need to carry this laptop around. You might ask, what does a chief digital officer do? I work on the kinds of things I love, video, interactives, apps, mobile, email, geolocation, things like that. We have a team of 70 people in digital media at the Met. That's separate from the CTO. The CTO has another team of several dozen people, 60 people or so, and we're attached at the hip. And we work together to w do the Met's work. So he does the, the uh, infrastructure, and we do the digital front-facing part of the museum. And I know that number seems really large, and it is. But it's a reflection of the commitment the Met has made that we are going to take the digital stuff as seriously as we take everything else. The Met has two locations today. It has the Met building on 82nd and 5th. And it also has something called the Cloisters, which is our medieval art collection uh, uh, at upper end of Manhattan. The Whitney Museum, a great, wonderful museum, is leaving its uh, 75th Street location, moving down to the High Line. And we are going to take that over. So we're going to have three locations starting next year. But we're also talking now about a fourth location. And that fourth location, in our, in our mind, is the digital space. And we want to give all four equal space or equal importance. And that's what we're trying to do. So if you're a chief digital officer, you're basically a chief listening officer, is what I like to tell people. And that means a whole lot of listening. We have 6.2 million uh, visitors in person. We have 2 million square feet of space, 45 special exhibitions a year. And that's a lot of things to process, right? And that means a lot of work as we're, as we're thinking about this. We're the world's largest museum building. The Louvre is uh, obviously much bigger in grounds, but we're bigger in the building space. And then there's our online numbers. But I tell people my job is to tell a million plus stories 
about our million plus pieces of art to a billion plus people. By the way, big mistake in a job that doesn't have metrics to tell your boss these are the metrics. <laughs> because now what can you do? Every day you can say, you're at 40 million, what's going on? How are we gonna get that one billion people? Bad idea, um, not, not smart. Any, again, any questions, just raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. And I've learned that art and technology have really gone hand in hand for years together. This is a famous piece of art that you know, the uh, Georgia O'Keeffe skull. And that's a punch card that maintained the information of that and kept that together. And what I love about it is that we still have it. And when I give tours at the Met, I actually pass it around. Most people have never seen one of these things. And, but technology is not just this kind of technology. The fact that any painting from the 1500s or 1500 BC is at the Met is because the artist used the right technology at the right time back then, right? Might have been the right pigment, right paintbrush, the right sculpture material. All of that is what resulted in this. And I want to show you um, the minutes from a meeting in April 1967 where the use of an IBM computer is being seriously considered at the Met. The use of an IBM is seriously being considered. Mr. Watson, everybody know who that is? The Mr. Watson of IBM was a board member. And so he has been instrumental in recent discussions. No kidding, right? Like he, is, he runs IBM, and he's been instrumental. And then, I love this part, somebody doubts that a computer would be a time-saving device. <laughs> the volume of questions and requests for photo photographs will increase, resulting from the greater availability of information. <laughs> this gentleman, I believe, is long gone from the museum, but I wanted to protect his identity. Uh, somebody, else says there has the, somebody else has been investigating the advances, advantages of using a computer in the library for some time. He cited two experiences which have, he has had with computers, stated they are successful for da 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 da. So this was the Met struggling with technology back in 1967, and we have that information, and I love that that's there, and that Mr. Watson is involved in all of this. That's pretty funny. Uh, sure, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, uh, 100%, and I should have made that clearer. What, our department, what do our 70 people do? We uh, run the gallery interactive. We have all kinds of technology in specific places in the museum. Oh, are you reading that? <laughs> <laughs> but guys, what you should, uh, guys and gals, what you should be seeing, these are the things he's using, so write them down, because these are, <laughs> you might, you might want to use them. If he's using it, it must be good. By the way, the other thing I didn't mention is that I will, uh, I always encourage you to do what I call name checking. If I mention somebody or something or a company, tweet at them uh, tonight and see if they respond to you. Often that happens at a session like this. Safe uh, uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> slick deals. Uh, but I want to just quickly share what happened the last time. I was preparing uh, for the session and a young student came up to me and said, what are you listening to? And I was listening to Guns N' Roses. And I, a sweet child of mine, anybody know that song? Okay. And I said, uh, uh, I said, Guns N' Roses, you know, old people's music. And I meant old people like me. Um, and this guy went and tweeted, Sri says, Guns N' Roses, old people's music. And so, so what? It doesn't matter. But Duff McKagan, who lives here and is a former bassist of GNR, tweets, who is this guy, Sri? Hmm? <laughs> I was really worried to be in, in Seattle. For the, I tried to leave as fast as I could. Uh, but that's, that's an example of name checking that went wrong. But if I do mention anybody, just tweet at them and see what happens. And also see, are people listening? Last night, if you go into my Twitter stream, you'll see I came in last night and I tweeted something from the Seattle airport. And as of 4 PM today, they hadn't yet done anything with that. I wish they had, and maybe they still will. But that's something to think about, right? Like, how are we listening? All of us think of social media as a broadcasting channel, but it's so much a listening channel. And we've got to be all better at that. And we have the same problem at the Met, that people will tweet at us, 
And they get really upset if we haven't started following them immediately or responded immediately. So it's not blaming the Seattle airport, especially since they have to fly out of there. Uh, but it is to just think about how can we all use this in kind of smarter ways. So uh, we have a team doing social media. We doubled our social media team to two people. And uh, one of the people who's the second person we hired, her Twitter handle is at Met Every Day. She used to come to the Met every day without a job and post every day uh, something from the Met. And so we had to hire her, right? Uh, and if she had done, you know, at Chipotle every day, she would have been at Chipotle, I guess. <laughs> but but it's, it's, the, it's the art of thinking about branding, right? That she was determined to work at the Met, but it came from a place of genuine interest, and that's what's important. Like, those of you who are bloggers and, uh, and folks like that, I tell people, people always say, how can I get a big successful blog? And I say, it's the wrong question. Ask, are you ready to blog? And if you won't do your blog for a zero audience and zero pay, you will never get to the place where it's paying and you have an audience. You have to be willing to do it for nothing in order for it to be something. Does that make sense to some extent? And I have so many cases of former students and other people who've had huge successful uh, blogs making real money, but it's because they were doing it just for the love of it. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a, a blog called Hodinkee, H-O-D-I-N-K-E-E. -E. Anybody heard of it here? Hodinkee is check for watch, and it's at Hodinkee if you want to check it out. And uh, this was a student of mine named Benjamin Clymer, C-L-Y-M-E-R, you can look him up. And he just loved men's watches, and so he, he created a blog. And he loved it so much that he decided to just keep doing it. And now he has had six, seven people working for him. Within a few months of doing it, British Esquire hired him to write a column on men's watches. Jay-Z hired him to uh, consult on Jay-Z's editorial website. Uh, and John Mayer, the musician, called him up and wanted to invest. But instead, he said, uh, why don't you write for me? So John Mayer now writes for this, uh, this guy. Uh, on, on Hodinkee. And what, when you look at the site, there are some specific reasons why he's been successful. His passion, his interest, but also just the way it's beautifully laid out and it tells great stories. And that's what we have to be thinking about in our work. So please check him out and name check him and tweet at him. Tell him we're talking about him in Seattle and see, see if he responds. But this Benjamin Clymer, and someone shout out his Twitter handle if you look him up. That'd be great. I think it's at Benjamin Clymer, C-L-Y-M-E-R. And, but this is that idea that you have to be thinking about that branding. So we do social media, we have, a, uh, MI, we have a media lab, I call it the poor man's MIT media lab, where we're thinking about the future of museums. Uh, we have a video team, we have an audio team, and Hanson has to come up and use his thumb. Uh, that's his son. Uh, oh, that's right. My son Hendrix was my Jimi Hendrix vinyl, so. Oh, that's great, okay. Uh, thank you. Well, we have a team. We have a team doing uh, collections information, which is the core of of the uh, of the museum. Uh, we also have a team doing the website. We have a mobile team. I hope you uh, will check out our app, which I'll show you in a little bit. But so all of these are things that we do. And the question was, is our job just to have things online? No, absolutely not. My job is to increase, the, to make the online experience so wonderful that people want to come to the museum. And once they're at the museum, have that be so wonderful that they want to go online and stay connected to us through our app, through social, through digital. So those are the kinds of things I think about. I've learned in the last year, you never know where good ideas come from. At the Met, we have 6.2 million visitors, but we weren't collecting email addresses. I went to another museum to speak the other day. They collect every person has to give their email address in order to buy a ticket. We don't do that. People can come and pay a quarter at the Met and walk in. And so that became uh, an issue. So we didn't have this. So the boss, uh, my boss, Tom Campbell, says, why don't we collect email addresses for the free Wi-Fi we give away? And I said, bad idea. I think all Wi-Fi should be free. right? It should be permanent and free and widely available. And he said, well, I'd like to try it, not with a paywall, but just an optional sign-in. And so I thought, bad idea. I said, we're going to get five email addresses a day, and four of them will be mickeymouse at donaldduck.com. 
But because it was an idea of the boss, we had to do it, and we did. And I can tell you that this is what we launched. Look how simple it is. You guys at, at Sam don't even have this, right? It's just free. It's wonderful. But we, we did this, and what happened... Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, these guys are not going to like it, but, uh, but, but look how easy it is to skip and connect. So here's what happened. By the way, that's the CTO of, uh, of Sam, so let's thank him for the free Wi-Fi. Let's thank him for the we got 190 people in one room. That's hard to uh, manage, uh, and there's a phone flying off into the corner over there. Uh, so here's where we, we did this, and I, I told you, no one's going to sign up, and even if they do, it'll be all fake addresses. Well, I can tell you that in four and a half months, We've just crossed 100,000 valid, non-duplicate email addresses with better click-through rates and open rates than our regular members. Think about that for a minute. Tanner, we're doing this. <laughs> but here's what happened, guys. When, I was, when this was happening, it took us four or five months to make it happen. And while I was, all the cool kids in the world we're talking separately and all the museum listservs and all the digital things about how terrible it is to have anything like this. So I never uttered a peep about this because I was so embarrassed that my museum was doing this. And I was so horrified that we were doing it. And so one of the lessons is you never know where a good idea can come from. It can come from an intern. It can also come from the boss. <laughs> and, and the fact that the cool kids don't necessarily know. Your chief digital officer may not know but because he's going to go with the trend or she's going to go with the trend, she'll say, don't do it. But think about it. I'm not saying you should do this. But what does it tell you? People love the museum. That's what it tells you. People want good information. They still unsubscribe, but as do other people. But we love what we've done with this. And it's an experiment. And we're, we're trying. And by the way, how to get anything done at the Met? Call it a pilot project. Right? <laughs> and so that works. Uh, we use it to tell people about our exhibitions, and uh, we, I, I have to find out what the number is. So please don't quote me on this, but you know, we send out millions of email addresses uh, a year, uh, tens of millions of email addresses. We have 150,000 members, uh, 50,000 of them who are not in the tri-state area, who are outside, including tens of thousands outside of the U.S., so we have to use email. And that's the thing. Um, the other day, a journalist asked me, what's, what's the, uh, what's the f digital trends for 2015? And I said, it's 2006 all over again. Email newsletters are hot. Podcasting is hot. Blogging is hot. And so that's why we're using email. Email makes the world go round. All the social media is just one more thing. But email still counts. Uh, this is my boss. We put him on Instagram, Tom Campbell. I hope you'll follow him. He's Thomas P. Campbell. And people said to me, Sri, you're Mr. Twitter. Why aren't you uh, putting him on, in on, on Twitter? I believe that there's much less drama on Instagram. <laughs> right? On Twitter, what are the problems? You have to know what, um, what the right handle is, what the right hashtag is. If you don't respond, people get mad. And there's all this drama on it. Uh, I believe that your bosses can do less damage on Twitter than they can do on, um, on Instagram than they can do on Twitter. Uh, when President Obama announced that he was doing Twitter, I wrote a column. Worst idea ever. I want him to run the country, not run Twitter, and get involved in flame wars and things like that. And so that's why we did this. Please follow him so that he'll tweet more, post, I mean, Instagram more than he is now. And he has, he's, that's right. Please take a look. I, I, I'm very proud to say that he does this all himself. Every single post. We worked with him. We sat down, uh, our uh, head of social media. Well, first we studied this, right? Does this make sense to put him on Twitter or Instagram? And then we started with Instagram. And you look at his posts. I'm very proud of what he's done. Uh, the other day he posted a picture of Harry Styles was in the room. I uh, was at the Met for three hours. If you don't know who it is, you're really lucky. Uh, but some of you are fainting just hearing that. Uh, depends on which age group you are. Uh, you're looking. Who's Harry Styles? Uh, I would just add that yeah. when visiting you, Shri makes a huge point. Take pictures. Yeah. Take pictures. Everyone is taking pictures. Yeah. And we want them to. Uh, the only restrictions we have on photography is on individual items in loan exhibitions. And that's because lenders still aren't, uh, aren't clear. And then we have restrictions on contemporary art and things like that. But the idea is people want to share. Let's let help them collect as much as we can. 
Uh, I, I'm sorry to say I bought one of these. I didn't have this two years ago. I am so ashamed. Does it hurt? <laughs> it doesn't hurt. I am so ashamed I own one of these. But you know what? They were at, at Walgreens. They were nine ninety nine. So I said, I got to buy this. I, 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 I didn't want to tell anybody about it, but I'm confessing. I don't know why I'm feeling confessional here. But, uh, but you know, this is a mistake. Why is this only $9.99? What's the real price? It's like 50 bucks. What's the, what's the catch? It's not the Bluetooth version. So what do you do? You stick the camera up there, and then you click it. No, you, well, you have to sort of, you have to go to the self-timer, and then click it, and then hold it up like this. And on the iPhone, it takes 10 photographs. So this is not going as well as I thought. But I'm, I'm thinking that the selfie stick is an important part of the culture, but if this is going to poke out someone's eye or damage, damage. so partly just to test it and see, see what it is. So I have another suggestion, if you don't want that, is something called an Ollie clip. Has anyone seen this? O-L-L-I-C-L-I-P. And see, uh, here's what it looks like. It's a little um, camera, sorry, it's a little thing that goes onto your phone. You clip it onto your phone and it makes it into wide-angle lens. And so it basically does what a selfie does. Um, so uh, it's called OLLI, O-L-L-I-C-L-I-P. So please take a look at that. And I, I'll have this around if you want to uh, experiment with it, put it on your phone. It works, this, this particular model works with the 5 and the 4. Any questions? OK. Uh, so please do follow him and check out what he's doing. I'm very proud of what he's doing and that we don't tweet, we don't help him in any way. But we all follow him very closely to make sure uh, he's you know, doing great work. And that's what he's doing. So uh, I think he's now up to 6,000 followers. On, and when he posts something, he gets five, uh, 500 likes, 400 likes. It's, it's, very, uh, it's, it's really nice. I've learned that we all have to be smarter about social media. So these are the Mets social media channels. And they look like a lot of channels, but they aren't really. Um, what you're seeing here are, is the work over eight years. We started with Facebook, and I know Sandra Jackson Dumont uh, started the uh, feed here. Please give her a shout out on Twitter. She's at Sandra Jackson Dumont, right? You can find her on Twitter. Uh, please uh, give her a shout out. Uh, and, um, and please follow her. She's doing such great work as the education head there. After sh rocking this place, she's rocking us in New York. But we then added each one. How did we decide what to add? Is the audience there? Are we ready? Are they ready? And that's how we, we're, we're, we're on this in very clear, strategic manner. And if you look at the uh, bit.ly slash Seattle slides, at the back end are 10, 15 slides from Taylor and Lucy, who run our social media, explaining our social media strategy. So please take a look at that. You have it already in your slides, so you can look at it. So each one of these is the work of careful strategic planning and, and, and deployment. And uh, we were on Instagram for about a year and a half now. We want to be for that. We're very proud of that. Uh, Pinterest. Uh, Flickr is kind of staying steady and uh, not growing as much, but it, there's still a lot of activity there. And I find Flickr is the home of the prosumer or the amateur professional photographer, right? Anybody here a big Flickr user? Raise your hand. Those are the kinds of people, the kind of semi-professionals are using it. The amazing thing, if you look through our 2 million photographs, I mean our 20,000 photographs, almost zero selfies. And some of you will want to join Flickr just for that. But think about that. Why? Hanson, why, why would you think that there are fewer selfies in Flickr land compared to, compared to this? So it's so that people will share real moments that other people will relate to, which is not what Instagram is about, what's not Twitter is about. So you're, 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 you're seeing that. And when I look at this, which uh, of these services would you say we have least optimized by looking at this? I'd say Flickr is one. The other is Instagram. I think we're pretty proud of 200,000. It's actually YouTube. YouTube is very, I think it's, it's nothing. To have 9 million views and 20,000 subscribers is nothing. We have so much opportunity with YouTube. Because a real, you know that the, the 
10 biggest people on YouTube have more than a billion views, and most of them are 18-year-old girls teaching makeup tips, <laughs> right? Or young men watching other young men play video games. I mean, it's insane, <laughs> right? Uh, pardon me? No, Minecraft's very important. Uh, but trust me, I have 11-year-olds. They are big on Minecraft. Oh, I understand. But, but just think about that, that that's, that so YouTube is very under-leveraged at the mat, and we're working on it. So everything has to be deliberate, strategic, smart, if you want to make it work. You have to put in the effort. Well, we doubled our social media team to two people so they can do this. And we used to post 9 to 5. Now we post 24-7. Fortunately, they don't work 24-7, using tools like Hootsuite, TweetDeck, all of that. And what you're also seeing here is that on YouTube, we have the uh, number one art museum video and the number two museum video of all time. The number one museum video of all time is called the Known Universe from the Natural History Museum. And ours is a single cabinet from Berlin in the 1700s. So the Known Universe and a single cabinet. And that's the beauty of YouTube. It can be anything, and that's what you see. I just want to point your attention to Weiboa, spelt Weibo, pronounced Weiboa, which is a Chinese language channel that is very strong, and we're on it uh, because Twitter, Facebook are all blocked. YouTube is blocked. What is not blocked in China is LinkedIn. Does anybody know why? Anybody know why LinkedIn is not blocked in China? Because they want that's the best way to find English-speaking Chinese people. And so they want, they want that to continue. But they're very clever about the kind of the business aspect of it. Questions or comments so far? Yeah. Uh, what song is that? Is it the Hanson's? It's Hanson's uh, six. Six plus. Six plus, sorry. It's, it's, it's actually, you know, it's actually my laptop. Look at the size of this thing. It's, it's my, I don't know what it is. It's, it's my TV. He said size matters, yeah. All right. Yes. How do you decide which social networks to join and are there any that you wouldn't join? Well, I can tell you this list used to have Foursquare on it. And I took it off. I, I don't want to offend anybody who works at Foursquare. Um, but I think that's a New York company. Um, I loved Foursquare. I used it every day, multiple times a day. And I don't check in anymore. It was an example of a company doing fine, and then they decided to pivot and make it better. And I don't think they made it better. And I don't use it anymore. How many people were Foursquare users a lot and then don't use it as much as they used to? Look around, right? This is the story of kind of every day that this happens in companies. And they now have two apps. I'm, there are people who use it, and you should use it. If you find use for it, of course it's great. But I'm just reflecting on my own use of it. And I will just say that uh, something shocking happened the other day. A curator at the Met sent me an email saying, hey, LACMA, the Los Angeles Museum, is on Snapchat. Why aren't we on Snapchat? And I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> because I never thought there would be uh, something called Snapchat for business. But there is. And LACMA is on Snapchat, which is pretty amazing. Um, how many of you are Snapchat users? Raise your hand. All oh, right. Uh, I should totally get on Snapchat. I have no time for any of this other stuff. I know. I know there are. I know. I know. This, but this is what I used to say about email, right? I used to say that I don't have time for email. I love my fax, right? And then I said I wouldn't join Facebook because I have email, right? And then you join, and then all that time suck is a big problem. But anyway, um, any uh, there were some questions around this specifically. Somebody raise hands. Uh, we have not moved to that. We have a Google Plus account. There is some activity there. But it depends on the brand. Uh, there are some brands that are doing fantastic work and are doing very well. There are others that are ghost towns. And you have to decide which one makes sense for you. So it's all about doing it with intention, as I said, care strategy. So just that we have not used it. We're not on LACMA. We're not on, LAC We're not on Snapchat yet. <laughs> but if you want to give a shout out to LACMA, you should and say good for them. For And by the way, this is the kind of validation that somebody at LACMA would appreciate that someone in Seattle says, hey, LACMA, great that you're on uh, Snapchat, because then they can show it to their boss. And the, my Sam friends here will tell you that that kind of external validation is really helpful. Yes? Um, I have a question about the Instagram account. I follow Instagram account. Yeah. Thank you. Really uh, Thank you. And so I was looking to change my Instagram account to who I'm following on Instagram. And to do that, I went to the Met to look for people to follow. And I noticed that the Met has a follow before you. 
Right. Any other criticisms? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Sure. No, I, I, I totally see, see what you're saying. Uh, it's partly because we have these two people, and uh, trying to get it all done is, is really hard. And what we do try to do is listen to the people that we are, who are posting for us. And you'll see we do a lot of retweeting, we do a lot of favoriting, we do a lot of responding. But the volume is, in, is incredible, and it's really hard. Uh, you'll see on my, on, my face, on my Twitter account, you'll see I follow uh, 6,000 people, so I don't think, but there, I have friends who follow 50,000 people, so it, it all depends what your capacity is, and that's why I wouldn't worry about comparisons or how am I doing versus somebody else. It's all about being a student of your own social media and seeing kind of what makes sense for you. Is that all right? Yes? How do you, well, I think I'm sorry, while you're talking, I'm just looking up for something here. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, sorry. Is this, sorry, one second. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's, 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 it's doing a slideshow on its own. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. So, so, no, so you're, you're, sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great question. My question was about plots. Yeah. Ironically. Yeah. Well, the, this is something that we have to think about. So part of it is we're teaching social media inside the Met. We're having workshops every other week or so, uh, multiple times. And we're, we have to bring people along. And this is something that's not about the Met. It's, I do that at Columbia. I've done this all over, the, all over the world, going and helping people trying to understand this. But it's also true that we're all learning together. And so that's, that's something. So if they, the more your bosses understand social, the more they'll understand the craziness of social. Right? So that's, that's how I would think about it. Okay, so let's move on. This is maybe the most important thing I'll tell you tonight. You should feel free to take a photo of it and tweet that if you haven't done it already. And I see people pulling out their cameras. That's good. <laughs> but post it, and people always tell me that when they post this or they type the text onto Twitter, they get more reaction than anything else they posted that day, ironically, on that. What? What? Oh, I love this. You can do this on the screen. Until you make a mistake. That's so important to what we're talking about, that you have to really think about this, that it's, it's until you make a mistake, which means that you have to be so careful in what you do. And our team, we make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time on Twitter. But you have to be really good and smart about revising, reviewing, that's why I want to give you a couple of examples of what has changed in, since the last two years that I was here. Two big things have happened. One is that it's much easier to edit inside Facebook. You can edit your own comments. You can edit your comments and you, you can edit your posts on, on um, Facebook. Very, very important. And you should all be using that feature. If you aren't, you're, you're leaving kind of opportunity on the table. But even bigger to me than that, is that you can now edit Instagram captions. That is huge, right? So that changes, that makes it more of a platform. Bless you, it makes it more of a platform when that happens. So if you're already doing that, I salute you. And if you aren't, please start doing that. Let's just see here, how many people are on Instagram anyway? Raise your hand. Wow, so two years ago that wasn't the case. I wasn't on Instagram, most people were not on Instagram. That's just happened. Questions about this? Yes. What do you do in the event that there is some sort of like, you know, disaster on social media? Like, say an employee like tweets something, there's a video that's going to come out and instead it goes out to like the Mets, too many followers or whatever. Is there like a, is there like a plan 
<laughs> Does there a plan? <laughs> Fire somebody. <laughs> it's a good plan. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, the, 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 we have a kind of contingency. Uh, the main thing is that we admit what happened, right? We, we say what happened, and we post uh, a, a follow-up right away, and we delete the offending tweet. I mean, we just do that. But you know this has happened all the time. You saw US Airways, what happened? Very famous. <laughs> Don't Google it. It'll be very shocking. Do not Google it. But somebody, this, this can happen. I'm surprised it doesn't happen more times a day. What happens is the social media person uh, is reading something, copies it into the clipboard. Then, an hour later, goes in and tries to copy something else, thinks she's caught the copy. Instead, it's the original thing. And then, just tweets it. And because there are all these shorteners and things, you don't notice that that's happened. And that's what happened to this person. It was, uh, it was horrible. The other thing that you saw on Twitter recently uh, uh, is that somebody po uh, thought they were ser uh, searching, but the box was actually tweeting. And this can happen very easily. So they, we don't guess what they searched. They said, they named their boss and salary. And they tweeted that, right? So it wasn't the result, but then everybody caught that. But I can, I can show you, if I can get into my Twitter for a second, I'll show you what I mean by, by the stuff that people, the other day I made a mistake and people retweeted, favorited at three times the rate of, and people who never retweet me all retweeted that. Right? That's, the, that's just the way people are. They like have fun. They're waiting for you to screw up. And these are some of your buddies. So imagine like your enemies or your competitors, what they might do. So I just wanted to go onto my phone and show you kind of the range of things that I'm thinking about and also give you some of my new, my newer, newer to me or new to me tips on, on some of these things. So one is let's just go into Twitter. And um, I love the ability to pin a tweet on Twitter that you can do. Have you all done that? Yeah. All of you should pin the, your most important tweet to the top of your page. You cannot do that in mobile, but you can do it on desktop. Everybody understand that, what I just said? Yeah? So these are all quotes, and people are, uh, feel free to take a photo. OK, I don't even know what that is. Okay. So yeah, I mean uh, that's what I think about. I, uh, I we'll just come, we'll just go into my feed here and just show you a couple of things. Um, just just what I want you to think about, right? First, please go into your bio and optimize your bio. I feel that that's the number one thing that people can do to improve how many followers they have, right? And by the way, I'll give you my social media success formula at the end of this session. If I give it to you now, you'll leave. So uh, we're going to give that to you at the end, but. Your, your bio should reflect the best current you. Does everybody understand that? Your best current you. That means you should be editing it all the time. You're working on a big project, post that there. Then remove it. Like, I, I forgot to do it today, but I'd go in and put in what everybody's saying about Paris, right? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but what is that they're saying? We are also, I am also Charlie? I read that as Le Jesus Charlie. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but then I was told. But <laughs> Uh, so, so think about think about editing this constantly. Every few weeks, is this as optimized as possible? Is your LinkedIn as optimized as possible? It should reflect your best current you. Your photograph really important. It should reflect a current picture of you. And when I move from Colombia, this is our Greek and Roman court, and that's what I, I I posted on there. A photo of you, not of you as a child, not you with your child, not of your child, but a picture of you, recent current photo. The header is vastly underused. You can build a collage. I put this up this morning, obviously a picture I took in, of in Paris, but I'd urge you to think about, I know a freelance writer who has taken, uh, taken four uh, uh, of his best bylines and put them together. It's a nice collage. Okay? So let me tell you something that didn't exist that I love called Canva. Anybody using this? Raise your hand if you're a Canva fan. Canva.com, Canva without an S is the best of the uh, social media tools for creating infographics and, and graphics. It's like a, if you can't afford to go to web school or web design school, that's what you want to use. And they have a beautiful thing for your Facebook cover, uh, Twitter cover, all of that. So check that out. I use it all the time. Can Canva, C-A-N-V-A dot com. Another one I like is uh, 
is FOTOR, F-O-T-O-R.com. These are all tools that help you that are like the poor man's uh, Photoshop and things like that. Uh, I used to, at Columbia, teach the graduate course in Photoshop, Illustrator, things like that. I haven't touched them in five years. The professionals need to keep using them. Amateurs like me don't need that anymore. We use tools like this. And by the way, as I'm shouting out stuff, if you think of something, shout it also if you think it's useful. I can't always see folks right away. Make sure everything, on, you have multiple things that are clickable in your bio. And you can see Met Museum is clickable, and Columbia Journ, Columbia, my wife's name, all of that is clickable. The Instagram is not, of course. And then put your email in. You want to be found, if in most businesses, you want to be found. You don't want to be hiding, you want to be found. And so that put your email address there, and then your main website. If you don't have a personal website, then please go in and put your LinkedIn, or your About Me, or your Flavors Me pages, but you've got to put something in there. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so just let's just go in here. This was a tweet I put up. We just, um, I told you podcasting is back, and I just joined a podcast series on CBS, has just launched a podcast series tonight at, uh, at CES. CBS just launched this, and they bought a company called Play It, and what it does is, um, I think I see my friend Sufatra leaving, so I just want to call her out there just for a second. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's the reason that I'm here at, uh, in, in Seattle. Uh, Sam did not fly me out here, so their money was not uh, spent. But uh, Sufatra brought me here uh, for uh, some work, and I want to thank her. And I think you should all either thank her or blame her. I don't know what exactly we should be uh, doing, but thank you very much. She was trying to sneak out without being any attraction, any, any being noticed, but thank you. Okay, I hope, yeah, he, he, was, he was nervous about doing social, so I hope we'll, we'll talk later. You, yeah, okay, great, thank you. Uh, so, so this is something we just launched, and I hope you'll take a look, and I hope you'll tell everybody about it. Uh, these are my friends who posted, this is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist named At Morin Toon, well that's not his name, uh, it's Jim Morin, At Morin Toon. Tweet at him, or tweet him, and, and, and then this is my other friend, Jeff Danziger, who's won lots of prizes himself. And, uh, but he's not on Twitter. And this is the difference, right? If you're an artist or any kind of professional, you're not on Twitter, you don't get a hashtag. You get a hashtag instead of a name. And that's, that's too bad. Uh, here, this is where I said I'm going to be silent on Twitter. And people breathe a sigh of relief. And, uh, and then just thinking about what you're, what you're posting and what you're sharing is really, really important. Your favorites are important. What are you posting? What are you sharing? What are you seeing out there is also, is also very important in what, you're, in what you're doing. And here, as people post, I just hit like. The Port of Seattle liked it. That's nice. Uh, the Port of Seattle is not the airport, right? But, yes, it is. Oh, it is? Ooh. It is the airport? Yes. Seaplanes only? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but SeaTac Airport is also the airport? Yeah, so the, it sounds like the parent company, the Port, Authority. Port Authority, got it, but not the other guys. Right? Don't say anything, guys, please. I need to fly out. Uh, I was just looking here. I was looking for something specific. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, what else can I show you? So work on your photo. Work on your bio. Uh, today I saw somebody who had posted a picture of themselves with, uh, with Magic Johnson. Now, that's not so bad, except his head didn't fit in the photograph. And you could only see his shoulder, so it just looked like a mistake rather than it's, it's Magic Johnson. Uh, B, I spend three to six minutes on every tweet I write. Three to six minutes. That's crazy, right? Why? Because social media is the only thing I do today that can get me divorced today. <laughs> Twitter is the only thing I do today that can get me fired today. And Twitter is the only thing I do ever that will be in the Library of Congress. Right? So I take it, I, 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 I'm tweeting and posting mostly for myself and being very careful about what I'm, what I'm doing. I encourage you all to do the same thing in what you're posting, too. Does that make sense? So let me just, yeah, go ahead. You had a question? How many times do you tweet a day, and what's your proportion of like, uh, retweets and retweets? And by the way, there are no rules about this stuff, right? We're just kind of all making this up as we go along. I try to do three, uh, five to eight tweets a day, but in a 24-hour cycle. And you might be two tweets a day. Somebody else might be one tweet. Somebody I met today was doing 15 tweets. Now they're doing two tweets. Depends on you. There's no rules, no guidelines. 
what makes sense. I have a lot of people who follow me in Europe and India, so I post at 2 a.m. Eastern time. That's prime time in Europe, prime time in India. I don't have to post, I use Hootsuite or Social Flow. Uh, what are some good tools? TweetDeck, let's look around. TweetDeck hold users, raise your hand. Uh, Buffer users, users, raise your hand. TweetDeck, uh, Hootsuite, sorry, Hootsuite. Social Flow, anybody? That's an expensive but very good product. If you're a brand, you want to think about using it. Clout, yes, K-L-O-U-T, and we can talk about that if, you, if you're interested. Uh, I want to show you a couple of new features that, I'm, uh, that, I, that I love on, face, on Twitter, is this idea of these four photographs. That's not a collage. It's four individual pictures that you can, just, you can just put them on. I think this might be a collage, but you can just put up to four photographs here, like this, without using up characters. That's a big change. So really cool, right? So you can put four, and you can mention up to 10 people. So that's like another 500 characters you suddenly, they gave you as a gift from Twitter. Oh, like somebody, something useful finally, one hour later. <laughs> Everybody got that? Who's using it really well? Tell me. If you're using it well, we'll go to your page and look at it. Anybody? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, so are we trending yet? Yeah. Anybody checking? Yeah. We have trended already? Yeah, we are. Oh, wow. That's great. Thank you. I hope you took a snap a screenshot and we'll share it. Thank you. Prize for you, right? Okay, we'll go. Um, so that's one thing that's big. So you're getting extra free 500 characters. Um, I, would also, I would also look at when you're posting, thinking about always having an image. You've heard this, right? When you have an image, people stop. See, look, if I'm going down like this, and these text ones, nobody's going to stop. But they'll go down and pause. Go down and pause. Go down and pause. And it's not because I work at the Met. Any picture will do. So think about always using a picture when you're posting. Doesn't mean you always use it, but think about using it. Every time I post, I try to have the following. A link, a photo, and an at mention on every tweet I write. Why? Because I'm crazy. <laughs> Why? Because even if no one else reads this tweet, that guy has read this tweet. Right? You want to make sure one person's read your tweet. That's all you can ask for. And the only way to do that is to uh, so tag them and then that they will then see that you have tweeted them. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go back in here and look at, look at one more thing here. One of the things that happened on Twitter was that I was feeling last year a little down on Twitter. In about the summer uh, and uh, late spring, I was feeling like, you know, you post something, you get like four faves, two likes. Does this ever happen to you guys? And you feel like, man, this is, is this really worth it? Are people seeing this? Two people saw this. But Twitter launched a new service called analytics.tweets.twitter.com. Right? You go to your photograph in Twitter and click on it, and it gives you all your traffic. First time. It was offered only to brands. It's now doing it for you. Who has launched that already? You have to actively put that in. So thank you if you've done that already. Raise your hand so that someone can ask you at the after party, maybe. Raise your hands. OK. Uh, after parties, uh, we're going to just, I don't know after party, we're just going to go over to uh, the lounge at the Four Seasons and uh, have drinks. But um, it changed my approach to Twitter because Twitter gave the analytics that they weren't giving us before. So here's what's going to happen. They've done this really nicely. In, in mobile, they do it like this. You click on view this, view tweet activity. I'd never seen this before until a couple of days ago. And let's see if it comes. Come on. Uh, no, it won't. So, no, it's not a URL. It's inside the Twitter app. Um, let me just do this again. Sam Wi-Fi. It should be there. Let's just go back. By the way, this is, you, you know these demos when you say something's going to happen and it doesn't happen? Here you go. Right? So, it does that. It shows you how many people clicked, what happened, etc. Everybody see that? So, how do you get this? First, you go to twitter.com, uh, analytics.twitter.com. Launch that, and then starting that day, you'll get traffic going forward. We don't have this for Facebook. We have it for Facebook business pages, but not for personal Facebook. You have it for personal Twitter. And then, on the, and then you just click on your face, and it says analytics there. And here, you say view tweet activity on your phone. And let me look at this one. Uh, so my usual average is two to 3,000 impressions and a couple of likes, maybe four or five likes. And 
right there you saw instead of, instead of thinking 15 people saw it, how many people saw it? 2,000 people saw it. Right? And that's okay, that's worth it. Even though I have allegedly 60,000 people, what did I tell you? Most people miss almost everything you do. So here, let's go in here, look at this. 238 tweets and 132 uh, favorites. Right? Now, let's, what, what do you think the number is going to be? Let's see. It's exciting. It's like a lottery here. Let's see what happens. Right? But it's still only 10% actually did anything. 8%, 2%, 1% retweeted your tweet. That's amazing that they did that, and I'm grateful. Right? But part of it was my silence. All day I didn't post anything, and I posted one thing. And that's also you should think about. Don't over clog those networks. And if you can't contribute anything useful, don't say anything. Is what I would suggest. Questions? Yes? How does the mass track notice come to a close? Very carefully. We have, we're, we're in the process of moving. We're using Wildfire, which is a Google product, which is a great product, bought by Google and now being sunset. So we're in the market for something, but we're looking at all the big, all the big small brands, etc. But I'll tell you something, you know, as in my job, and I'm sure the CTO here is the same way, you can spend your entire day looking at vendors and meeting with vendors. And the other day, a social media listening company came to us and pitched us this whole thing on listening. I said, great, we'll experiment with it. And then three days later, I got a phone call, and I hate it when vendors call, cold call you, and said, hi, we have this new uh, uh, social media listening platform. We'd like you to try it. Completely unconnected that we were already trying it and they're a social media listening company, right? So that brings me to an important point I want to share with all of you, that social media gives us the first time ever insight into the people we want to connect with. And there are some wonderful tools you should be using. One is called Reportive. Anybody using this? Raise your hand. It, thank you. Uh, it was bought by LinkedIn for $40 million. And what it is, is in your Gmail, it shows you background of everybody who you're writing emails to and it shows you what they're doing and what I tell people is R-A-P-P-O-R-T-I-V-E -P -P -E. and if I had my desktop I'd be jumping all over it but I don't have time uh, Rapportive.com and um, it's an add-in on, on, on Gmail. I'll give you a couple of other Gmail add-ins that I pay for. Rapportive is free. I use Boomerang. Anybody using Boomerang? Look around you. That's great. Uh, Boomerang, there's a free version. What it does is you, you email, let's say I email Hansen, and I can set it to Boomerang to me if he doesn't reply in three days. It'll come back and say, Sri, do you want to, you it's like a tickle file. That's not what it sounds like. But uh, I think it's called a tickler, right? Um, anyway, uh, it's 11 o'clock. What do you expect you know, uh, from me? Uh, so, uh, so I use Boomerang. Uh, also, I noticed that in, in some corporations, if you, like, if you have insomnia and you email at 1 a.m., like people say, oh, you're up at 1 a.m. So what I do is I write the email at 1 a.m. and I set it to go at 7 a.m. You can control that on Gmail. Another one I use is called Banana Tag. Anybody Banana Tag, anyone? Uh, don't Google it, that's right, <laughs> don't Google it. Uh, banana, don't Bing it. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what it does is uh, it tracks every one of your opens and much better than Outlook and it tells you what they clicked inside. It's like MailChimp or any of those services but for individual emails rather than newsletters. So it's pretty scary and pretty good. Um, reportive, uh, as I said, is, is, is really good. But anyway, so what I, what I tell people is don't be an ask on social media. There's a K in there. Don't be an ask on social media. What does that mean? Don't be an ask. Don't be the first time someone hears of you is a request for something. I, this happens to me all the time where, not because I'm important, but that means they're not thinking about this. Where they write to me in three, I want this, that, the other thing. Wouldn't it be nice if they followed me first for a couple of days? Then I would notice, oh, who's this who's following me? Right? Or they retweet me. Oh, that's nice. Now I owe them a favor. Right? It's like you're building a chip. Rather than just cold calling people, I don't cold call anyone. I don't cold email people. Right? Try to make that kind of, it's about human relations. And we created a social media policy at Columbia and we said, first line, what's common sense in real life is common sense in, in social media. Right? So if you're posting something, like you met someone at a cocktail party tonight, you won't say, hey, please hire me. Right? You would tell them who you are, be intriguing, be interesting, 
and then it works like that. So that's what I would urge you to think about as well. So don't be an ask on social media is what I say. Questions? Yes. For institutions that are using social media as for events, yeah. I think what you just said about don't be, it's tricky to be helpful mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yep. how do you, how, after, after that, how do you... So this is, goes back to the other person's uh, uh, point, uh, point too, that we, I, when I came in, I was going to say we should be tweeting a lot more other people's stuff. I, my own policy, one in every ten tweets is about me. Everything else, the number one thing I tell people to do on social is be generous. Post about other people, share about other people, be a great pointer to other people's content. If you, got, if you bought a ticket before today, you probably got an email from me, and the, one of the lines in there said, be a great pointer, and I pointed to the best thing I posted all year. It wasn't by something by me. It was by a woman named at Katie Lance, K-A-T-I-E-L-A-N-C-E. -E. So point to other people, but at the Met, it just, just like that email, just like the email Wi-Fi thing, people love our content, so, but I, as I said, today we're posting about Paris, we're posting about other museums, we're resharing, re retweeting, so try to do that. But for your own self, don't keep pointing at yourself. I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, another question? Another question? Yes. I'm curious the role of balance. Like, do you unplug if you do? How? When? Uh, people used to ask me that exact question about email. Right? They would ask me, how often do you get off email? What do you do? And that was because everybody else was not on email at the time as much as we were. And the thing that changed was the Crackberry, right? Once that became something everybody had, then everyone was on it, and people stopped asking me about email. And I think that I'm certainly on all of this too much. And I try to, this, this, people do these things called a digital detox. Has anyone done that? Where for the holidays you unplug? Hansen does that. Uh, and I recommend it. I don't do it, but you know, you ever met a doctor who smokes? I'm like that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Please do that, but um, I, don't, I don't do it myself. But it's also this idea that what makes sense for you. Part of the reason I don't detox is a whole lot of crap piles up that then I have to answer and do anyway. So I, the one way that, the only time I remember the last two years where I had done a detox was by accident. I went on a cruise. And you know cruises are like $3 a minute to use the internet. So I, set, I very cleverly set up all these tweets on Hootsuite and went. And there was some mistake on one tweet, and there's all this stuff going on. And I was blissfully in the <laughs> south, uh, in the Caribbean somewhere, and that taught me not to have a detox, right? So <laughs> that's you have to be careful about this, and uh, 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 when you're doing this stuff, let me just quickly go through and show you a couple of other things. Any questions? Please, please feel free. I'll just show you a couple of tweets and uh, what we're trying to do. I want to show you. Um, just going to go on my on my page here and show you these apps that I love. And, um, and uh, here, anybody here using TripIt? I don't know how anyone travels without TripIt. It is the most useful travel site. It is an, an app. What it does is it shows you, uh, it takes, uh, let me just go back in here. And, I'm sorry? Concur is based here. Okay, so that's, that's awesome, right? So what this does is, you know you get your email from the hotel, email from uh, airline, email from all these things, and it's in tiny font. All you do is once you have the service, you just email plans at tripit.com. And it builds this beautiful uh, thing here that you can use right away. So here, let me show you. In two weeks, I'm going to be in Paris, and I'm so excited to go to Paris. Uh, and look at this. It just builds it in right away in this really nice font. and. And if there's a change, it alerts you. And you just email it to plans at TripIt. If you don't have a phone, it doesn't matter. Uh, this, uh, this was bought by Concur. And then Concur was bought by SAP for $8 billion. I'm sure they didn't buy it for this, but uh, I would pay $8 billion for it. Uh, you can use the free version. I used it free for five years. And then I paid 50 bucks to pay just as a thank you to them. They also have the best frequent flyer mileage tracker on there. And I really like it. And it's free, as I said. So check out TripIt. Um, then, what else do I have on here that I can show you? Sorry. Um, number one networking tool you're not using. Anybody know this? Time hop. 
Thank you. Uh, time hop is um, a tool that uh, sends you your own social media from up to eight years ago. You say, this is awful. Why would I ever do anything with this? Right? Uh, I'm going to show you why it's important and why it's changed the way I do things. First, let me pull up what I posted last year. This is a five megabyte IBM hard drive. It weighed 1,000 kilograms in 1956. That's pretty funny, right? It's worth it just for that. But what it does, just to show you, is these are all the things you posted two years ago, three years ago, etc. And so you'll say, well, what is the use of this thing? Well, what it does is it becomes a networking tool. This wonderful woman named Ashita in Mumbai threw a party for me. And today, I got reminded of it. And I sent her a note saying, Ishita, thank you for this party again. And it was like a little bit of networking without being an ask. right? When you connect for no reason, that's the best part. And I know many of you are men pro mentors of people. And you have these mentors who will only contact you when they want something. You know what I mean, right? Uh, the best mentees are the ones who will just write to you and say, how are you doing? I saw your article on this. Good work. Or otherwise, like, I need a reference in the next two, two days, and it's got to be 1,000 pages, right? Like, that's so frustrating. But this is what you can do. But it turns out the number one person I uh, network with on this is my wife. As parents of twins, we don't get to see each other much. We don't talk much about uh, enough about us. And I'll find a photograph, and I'll just send it to her and say, hey, remember this. And it's a little, like, digital. Oh, OK, little digital connection. I was worried what came up. I was really worried about that uh, on my phone. So, so this is the kind of thing you can, you can easily, easily do. Here, I posted, this is something from the Met from three years ago. And today, I emailed this to my boss. And I said, hey, three years ago, I was still talking about the Met before I got there. And so I hope, instead of her thinking, why is this guy in Seattle wasting his time? She's thinking, oh, I hired the right guy. He really loves the Met. Right? That's, what you, that's what you're seeing with this. And um, you're, you're, you can connect and network. And I got the best thing I got out of this was an invitation to South by Southwest. How? I saw something from six years ago, and I just sent it to that person saying, hey, nice to, uh, nice to be reminded of this. And she said, I'm looking for a speaker. We'll, we'll bring you to South by. Are you free? And I'd never been. And I'm going this year. So this app can affect your life if you use it in the right way. Again, it's because I contacted her, not saying, please bring me to South by. I didn't even know she was involved. But that's what you can think about. Uh, a couple of thoughts here on, uh, uh, on one of the problems on Instagram is that uh, Instagram is no longer tied to Twitter. You know this, right? When you post on Instagram, only a link goes to Twitter if you ask to do that. You know this, right? It's, really uh, a problem. So there's an app for that, and it's called this, IFTTT. Any, any users of it? It's yeah. very geeky, and I didn't use it for years, because I couldn't understand it. I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer. I play one on TV. But this one now is so easy. You, you make these, it's like coding, but without the coding. So what you do is you say, I want everything you post on uh, Instagram. So these are the recipes I have. Look at this. If I star an email in Gmail, create a reminder in my iPhone. Um, email me 10 things to know this morning. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, if I post something on Facebook, post it on my iPhone photos. There are all these formulas you can make. And you can turn them on and off if you don't want it. So here, I turn this off. Post Instagram pics in Twitter as a picture, not a link. Oh. Huge, huge. Also, uh, also on Twitter, my wife and I were on the news site, and we had hooked it up to uh, Seattle to 911, so we could actually go to bed at night, and our phones would tell us if there was a fire that needed to go to in the specific area that we covered. Oh, wow, because you cover it. I was thinking, why would you do this? Now, now you're a journalist, that's why. Awesome. That's, that. we got to go out to fire at 2.30 in the morning. And so that's wonderful. That's great. Right. Your phone starts running and you can give it a phone check. Amazing. That's, that's great. You should publish that recipe. I think people would want it. Uh, it's changed a little bit, but yeah, it's about 15 minutes away, though. It's about 15 minutes away. 
Thank you. Hi. Five years? You think I have five years? <laughs> uh, let, me, let me show you a, a, a particular item that I want to, uh, sorry, let me just go to the app. So um, I'm going to come back to you in a second, if you will. If you just hold that thought, and maybe I'll end on that. Is that okay? Uh, you'll remind me, and Hanson will have to jump up here again. Uh, okay. So I just want to go through these, and then I'm going to answer that question. That might be the most important question of all, right? Uh, people ask me, what have you achieved in one year? I say, very little. These hashtags, every exhibition now has a hashtag. Right? But look how subtle it is. If you know what it is, you'll use it. If you don't know, it doesn't matter. One day, every hashtag will be in the title. One day, the title will be the hashtag. We're not there yet. Take a photo of this. This is Erica America at Twitter has this great line. If you're good in real life, you can be great on Twitter. What about you guys? You're great in real life. If you're great in real life, you can be awesome on social. But if you're bad in real life, you'll be awful on social. And why I want you to take a picture of this is, these are from five social media lessons I learned from Roger Ebert. I never met him, but I learned so much from him. So please go to bit.ly slash threebert, just photo, take a picture, and you'll read what I think is one of my favorite pieces that I've written. Oh, sorry. OK? And then you never know who's coming to the Met. There's Jerry and his kids. The other kind, not Jerry, kid. remember Jerry and his kids is Jerry Lewis. This is Jerry Seinfeld. That's funny. All right. Um, the cultural landscape is changing faster than you think. I recommend everybody read Laplaca Cohen's Culture Track Study. Uh, just go to my slides and click Culture Track, and you'll see it. And by the way, I added the word culturally promiscuous, not promiscuous. Well, maybe promiscuous, I don't know. We need an art break. There's a, one of my favorite paintings at the Met. Everyone wants a peek behind the scenes. And I urge you to think about this in your, in your company. How would you do this? Uh, what you're seeing here is a painting we acquired from, um, a, 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 this is about a Parisian painter. And that's why I wanted to share this very quickly. This is a painting that came into the Met but it had been in England, folded, and stuck in a frame for 250 years. Do you see that crease at the top? The Met would have run away from this crease. Instead, we are doing hash embrace the crease. And here, what we're doing is we're blogging along the way, first time, that we're blogging the restoration of this. And you can click and read all the posts about it from our senior, senior staff. And you'll see our senior conservator with a 99 cent swab make a downstroke and look at the baby's toes come alive. I've learned mobile is more important than you think. I talked about that. I just wanted to share with you my principles for our app, which we're very proud of. And it's just the Met. If you search, you'll find it. And these were the three things. Useful, simple, delightful. And what that, what that means is don't try to make an app that is your museum in your pocket or your website in your pocket. That's not what it should be. Simple, useful, delightful. Do a few things and do them really, really well. And then that's what we, we did. And these are, these are the people we, who did the project. And it was done out of the Northwest in Oregon with a company called Instrument. And if you're working for on uh, an app and you want suggestions, I'll send you our top 10, our finalists, so that you can talk to them. It saves you time um, as you're looking. These are the apps that um, we used as a guide. One at the bottom, anyone recognize that? New York Times Now, NYT Now. I deleted my main New York Times app when this came along. It's only 30% of the New York Times, but it's the right 30%. Check that out. Um, Camera Plus you really don't need because it's now, there's, there's just so many better, uh, the cameras have improved in the, in the things. I told you to trip it. Anybody know Moves? Moves tracks your steps, but you, uh, you all have these bands and things, but this one, it just tracks it on your phone. So as you're walking, you can see that. But what I really want to talk about is Dark Sky. Anybody using that? A few of you, right? Dark Sky is started by two guys who were offered millions of dollars by a weather company, and they turned it down. What does it do? It does one thing. It tells you whether it's going to rain where you're standing in the next hour or not. In Seattle, the answer is yes. Uh, in Dubai, the answer is no. 
So in other places, we can use something like this. I presume in Seattle, it's zero use. But it, it's, it's also the utility and the beauty, just so beautiful. Each of these apps looks good. People want to use it and, and, and keep it. So we created these buttons. We put them on, on the website. Uh, we were on the App Store. And look, we were named one of the best new apps. And we were between Instagram and ESPN, not typically the places you expect the Met to be hanging around. right? We treat the Met, we treat our work as a startup inside a 150-year-old company. And that's where we want to be in places like this. And then the hardest thing I did was put that stamp on George Washington's face on a map, which is pretty funny. We also learned that we're all in this together, and that's why you'll see, like Sam and I and the Met are friends, right? We, we all are in this together. I was on a panel, and my son looked at the brochure, and he said, isn't that your biggest enemy? He's the head of MoMA, right? <laughs> and I said, we're all in this together. We're not enemies, we may be frenemies, we might be in co-opetition, but we're not. Anyway, we took a selfie together at another time uh, because, of, because we wanted to prove we're not enemies. So many cool things happening in museums. The Cooper Hewitt, which is this big design museum, has just redone the entire thing through a pen. I urge you to come and check it out. If you want to know the guy who did it, his name is Seb Chan, at S-E-B Chan, C-H-A-N. Anybody know Seb? He's terrific. He's from Australia. Tweet him. Tell him we're talking about him here. At the Brooklyn Museum, I love this. They have a genius bar. When you walk up to them and you say, it's raining today, do you have any sunlight photographs or sunlight images? And they'll give you a list of that. So it's a, it's a genius bar, and that works pretty well. Okay. Um, I've learned that getting the word out is important, but it's not easy. Anybody know this man? He's one of the top 10 most important unelected people in the world. It's Sal from Khan Academy, Sal Khan. And uh, he, we're, we're doing a project with him. We just put 100 of our videos on his platform. I hope you'll check it out. He does partner content now. And he said something that changed my life in a way. He said, the vast majority of people who can benefit from my free service tonight, their children's lives I can change tonight, are not, have never heard of the service and will never hear of the service. Think about that, right? That if he can't do it, then I was so depressed after that. Like, then what hope do we have? So how we changed my life was saying we have to be selling. We have to be marketing. If he has to market, then we have to market as well. We talked about this already. That's our way, Boa. Expertise matters. In the t age of social media, we used to talk about our timeline of art history at the Met was one third of our traffic. Turns out it's two thirds of our traffic. Remember I told you, expertise, you'll stand taller if you're a professional, and that's what we're seeing as well here. You have to build your own audience. This is so important. We're doing a Mets pro kids product for the first time, launching in June, but we've already launched it on YouTube and on Twitter, and we're using the hashtag. And this will be the first project at the Met with a hashtag as its name. And it doesn't launch till June, but we're posting it now. You have to help your, museum, your, your group understand, your audience understand. I love this. Anybody been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? What they do is they know it's hard to shoot the jellyfish through the water and the glass. So they say, we got it. Here are some beautiful pictures so you can enjoy the jellyfish. Isn't that brilliant? I, just, I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea. And we should all be thinking about giving, spoon feeding people. Storytelling counts. We did 100 videos of our, of our curators talking for two minutes each about their favorite prop items at the Met. It's called 82nd and 5th, and you can, you can find that very easily. The Degas, you know. We have to be more about open to repurposing, redisplaying, resurfacing our own content. Too many times we're saying, what is new that we can pull do? Instead of participating in things like TBT. Everybody know TBT, right? Throwback Thursday. There's so much good stuff we already have. Let's reuse it, not just once. When Hansen had his great book out, Storyteller Uprising, one of the things he did was he'd post it, and then he'd post something else from it another time. A lot of people think if I post it once, everyone has read it. No one's read it, and you have to think about that. These are our 17 Van Goghs are together for the first time in a dozen years. But you come to the Met, no one will tell you that. Why? Because we have 45 exhibitions to promote. And at the Met, well, we, you'll just, so I, I try to tell people about that, but it's so hard to do this. 
So you could have 17 Van Goghs and people won't even know. It's the largest collection this side of the Atlantic. And I, I, I watch people in the galleries and they're just like, you know, I call it the Museum Mosey. You ever seen this? Right? So and then I say, I pull them aside, 17 Van Goghs. They go, oh my God. They start taking selfies. One guy called his mother and said, Mom, you got to come and see this. But how do we do that with 6 million people? It's really hard. We can learn from all kinds of people. I want to give a shout out to this young lady. Anybody know her? She started an important movement called Why I Stay. But why did it work? Because she didn't set out to start a movement. This was the Janae Palmer, Ray Rice story. And an anchor said, I, she wouldn't have stayed if, it would matter, if, if she really cared. She could have left easily. She was listening. She, she's an HR person. She turned to her Twitter and wrote, why, hash why I stayed, and said, you know, some horrible thing that had happened to her. And she became this leader of a movement. I think one of the worst things that happened to social media people of the last year was the ice bucket challenge. Because <laughs> now every one of the, our bosses is telling us, where's our ice bucket challenge? <laughs> you know, have this happen to you? It is never going to happen again. Just tell them that. But there are these consultants who will come and tell you how to make the ice bucket challenge. It's not going to happen. That was a confluence of you know, lucky strikes of all kinds of things. But we can learn from her, and that's really important. And, and study other people outside your field, and I think you will really benefit from that. So we want to wind up here and take maybe one, Hanson, one more question. I have that one last question sure. there. Do we have another question? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so our, our, in our case, it's a little different. Our, because we have all that gallery space, most of our good stuff is on display. We have lots of drawings and prints, maybe a million of those that some of it can never be displayed because they're so fragile. But we also have the largest baseball card collection outside of Cooperstown, 30,000 baseball cards, and we have 150 up at any time. So that's a good place to think of our strategy. We rotate them. We try to... When baseball season starts, we try to do stuff. We try to send it to people. So here, like, wouldn't it be great if uh, the field here, what's it called, Safeco? Wow. Uh, uh, if, it's, if it's celebrating uh, its 100th, 5th anniversary, I don't know, whatever it is, wouldn't it be great if we had our, our cards here, a selection of them here? I mean, if 30,000, what's the problem, right? So like that, you have to connect that physical and digital, and you have to keep trying to do those kinds of things. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, so how do you um, keep your social media content that is, you know, promoting the net as if you're in a field with an actual space, um, as well as getting buy-in from other like a social collection, for instance? Um, sure. Uh, well, what we do is we show success to them. Right? Every time you do something, at the end of an exhibition, we send them a list of all the great tweets, all the feedback. A lot of people don't know what these numbers mean, but they understand when somebody puts in quote marks, greatest exhibition ever. They understand that. So somebody said to me, Sri, you're going to get killed by having these 100 curators who won't want to do all the stuff you want to do. And I said, I don't want 100 curators to do stuff. All you need are the partners that want to, the ones who step forward. You saw in the Yabak painting, that one I showed you, they're the two most senior people at the Met. Right? When the Met first did the web, I was under Philippe de Montebello, the famous sun king of the Met, and he was the right person for that era. Tom Campbell's the right person for this era. So we had blogs, but no comments were allowed. When we did the Yalbach painting, the first comment was by Philippe de Montebello, and we thought it was a fake. Someone was like, you know, but it was him. So we all move along just the way that we, we did with email and other things as well. And I should also say this title of Chief Digital Officer, I think, is transitionary. You will not need a Chief Digital Officer because the CEO will grow up digitally. A curator will be digitally savvy. There's a guy named Henry Timms who runs the 92nd Street Y. Uh, if someone knows his Twitter handle, if you'll shout it out. He is the first person that I can think of. He's the CEO of the 92nd Street Y. 
He would have, he created Giving Tuesday. Do you know? You all know Giving? This one man created it. Henry Timms. What is his Twitter handle? Somebody tell me. Uh, T-I-M-M-S. And uh, he got the job in part because he created Giving Tuesday, right? It was in their wheelhouse. He showed the digital stuff. So that's what I think is going to happen. So it's, it's H. Timms. Thank you. Tweet at him and wouldn't you like to know the guy who created uh, Giving Tuesday? T follow him, tweet at him. Don't ask him for anything now. But invite him to come out here and share what he's doing. Yes, in the back. Oh, yeah. And he tweets like flowers that come in that get used out every week. Every he tweets like, you know, the table setting. And so he all does like marvelous things of disrupting what the dimension behind the scenes I'm sure of what he's a large part of the revenue stream. Yep. And I, you know, I think he's doing amazing work doing that. Thank you. Uh, if you have her Twitter handle, everybody can uh, say hi to her. Uh, that's great. Thank you. We had one another question, yeah? Go ahead, yeah. So we can't respond 24 hours, but we do. If you if you look at, you'll see a lot of responses from the Met throughout the day, a lot of um, uh, clicking, liking. Here's our boss. Look, I didn't, we didn't even tell him this. This is our boss on his own. Wow. I haven't seen this. That's pretty amazing, right, for him to do that and to say that on his own. Right? This is amazing. No, no, but he, the fact that he posted is what I'm saying. That The fact that he posted that and he put RIP and Charlie Hebdo, right? Yeah, he, had, he didn't have the time. This is one of the busiest men in New York. So we showed him the workflow. So, but we also showed that he, he travels around the world. And we showed him that you can do this. Ladies, don't faint. That's, um, this is. <laughs> uh, what, what we did was we said to him, collect all the pictures anyway. And then we will, po you can, I mean, you will post it when you have time. So on the plane, he's sitting there. He can do that. He can edit the pictures. You don't have to be, this idea that everything has to be real time, live. Like today, I have all these great things I shot around Seattle. I would have posted all day today, but I didn't because out of respect for this stuff. Right? So that's what I would think about. Uh, for example, I will show you. No, no, well, we, I mean, he, he was a pilot project. <laughs> uh, he didn't expect these reactions. The response is the reason he's so happy with it, because he, he has validation. And who doesn't like that, right? So I'll just show you here. Look at what I saw today. Incredible. Every phone at the Apple store in Bellevue has our app on it. I wanted to scream and tell everybody, but I didn't. I'm going to wait till tomorrow, right? But that's because I, you don't have to be obnoxious on social media. When the world is like blowing apart, you don't want to be promoting yourself. Right? That's what I did there. Yes. OK, last question. And then I'm going to answer his question, and then we're done. Great, I, yeah, sorry, just to cut you off because we want to just, yeah. Uh, I think one of the worst things on Facebook is when you get an alert saying you've been, uh, someone's talking about you. And then you go and it's just some random person tagging you to read the thing. You're not in it. The wording says you, a photo of you. So you run and you see it and it's like some, something else, right? Let's not let that happen in Twitter. I'll only do it if, so what I'll do is I'll post a menorah for Hanukkah and say, thinking of my Jewish friends, hear something, and then I'll tag 10 Jewish people that day. <laughs> and then I do the same thing for uh, Eid, for Muslims, for Diwali. I do Hindu folks, right? So, but I do multiple. And you can do them multiple times. So that's the way of thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. You should. It's, a, it's, the same as, it's the same as mentioning it. And you save the character. You get 500 characters. So you, you can absolutely uh, do that. So I'm going to uh, answer that question, and then we're done. We're going, if anybody would like to join us, I haven't had dinner, so I'm going to eat at the lounge. It's called the Art Lounge at the Four Seasons. They've got a table if you want to come. You don't have to eat. I'll buy maybe some chips and sandwiches for people. 
but uh, you'll buy your own drinks uh, um, for five bucks. What do you expect? Um, but I want to and six seventeen. Sorry, but I wanted to just say uh, one thing. I'm so grateful to uh, Hanson and Ucom and Ashley Rose who were, who put all this together. Let's thank them, folks. We really this is incredible. And the reason, and um, I'm going to donate. Uh, they have a wonderful scholarship program uh, uh, called Calm Leadership Program, right? Calm. It's a program, so I'm going to donate $250 to it uh, as a thank you to them and $250 to the Seattle Art Museum for hosting us. And it's not because I have a ton of money and $250 is nothing for the need, but um, the reason I'm going to do it is because the reason I'm here is, and these guys don't know it, that Sufatra came to the last session two years ago and then asked me to come back and paid for my way here and everything else. So I owe you guys at least that much money. Um, but I want you to think about this idea of gratitude and being generous and posting. And if you found value of more than $5 today, I hope on your way out there's a box. You'll put five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever, $1 in there. Every bit helps in a museum. And I really appreciate it. So I just want to answer his question, which was, how do I justify my job? And do I have five years to prove the value of it? And I don't. I'm sure we'll, you know, 70 people's big shiny target, right? So we have to show value in everything we do every day. And um, a particular exhibition has given to me the reason why I exist. And there's a guy named Carlton Watkins that I'd like you to look up at some point. And he did pictures of Yosemite in the 1850s. Has anyone heard of this? And he did these mammoth pictures. They're called mammoth because they were this big. Photography used to be this big. And he took mules and went in Yosemite and shot these beautiful black and white pictures of Yosemite. Abraham Lincoln sees this in the middle of the war and decides no man shall touch this land and signs a law a few months before he dies saying this is never going to be touched. And that's the birth of the modern conservation movement. Teddy Roosevelt gets rightly all the credit for the national parks, but the first was done by Lincoln. And we have an exhibit right now of Carlton Watkins. And what is so amazing is that Abraham Lincoln never went to Yosemite. He saw it only in the pictures. And that's how I justify what I do. That if we can make the facsimile or the digital so good, people will want to go and see it in person. Does that make sense to everybody? So I really, really appreciate um, the attention and time you've given me. I promised you my social media success formula. It is in the slides. Right? Remember, bit.ly slash Seattle slides, it's in there. I want you to look at it on your own, or we'll look at it at dinner uh, or drinks over there. But I just want to, again, please, please thank the folks at uh, ComLead, at ComLead, and the folks at uh, Seattle Art Museum. Let's thank them very much. Thank you. And Shri, thank you. I don't think it's Mike's Shri, thank you very much. You know, he's just so bloody generous. He did this for free, and he's giving money to us. I was going to ask him for a commission for the Microsoft thing, but it's great. Um, and you know, I, I'm a year older than Shri, but I was one of his first students, and it's obvious that I'm still learning. We're all still learning. And with that, I want to officially close the Shri fire hose for this year. Um, but I look forward to make, make this an annual or a biannual well, event. Thank you. You're Thank welcome you. here in Seattle. Oh, this is your second. So thank, thank you. you very much, and thank, thank you all. For thank coming. you all for coming.